want to I want to welcome you. My name is Sheila Cook, and I'm with 3LM, which stands for Land and Livestock Management for Life. We're delighted to have all of you with us tonight. And I'm just going to turn off that bell so we don't have to hear that bell here. Okay, there we go. Um, this is the 10th of November 2022, and we have a very special um, session in store with Andy Weir and Jen Hunter of Fernhill Farm. And the topic is demonstrating achievable change, ut utilizing data to guide land management decisions. We, um, meaning Christopher Cook and myself, we met Jen and Andy in 2016. And I got this email out of the blue from Jen. And it said something about futuristic wool and would holistic management help with that? Um, and she had been a Nuffield scholar and we, she and Andy were working really hard to have a real high quality wool off of their sheep. Um, and we, they were looking to get into holistic management and we've had a firm and fast friendship with them ever since. And I'm delighted to have them tell their story. And so without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Andy and Jen. And um, as you come up with questions, please type them into chat. Um, and uh, Al Alex Zelli of the um, Somerset Wildlife Trust will be tracking your questions. And she's going to uh, lead the Q&A session at the end. So we're going to begin with Jen and Andy both setting the context so you understand about their farm and how they got uh, to doing what they're doing. I'll then give you a brief explanation of what is ecological outcome verification. Um, and then Jen and Andy then will come back on and explain, well, how, how did they use EOV? to influence their management. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Andy and Jen now. So go ahead and there you go, excellent. Okay, thank you very much, Sheila. So as a quick introduction from myself, so I'm Jen, um, Andy is my I just wanted to start uh, right back in 2015 when I was very fortunate to be awarded a Nuffield Farming Scholarship Travel Bursary. Um, it all started from wanting to add value to our um, homegrown sheep fleeces here on the Mendix. And um, adding value to wool was something that I just couldn't really find anybody to help me. Um, so I set off on my number of travels, went to 10 different countries, three different continents. And these photos that you can see in front of you are from when I ended up in Patagonia, um, a beautiful place called Koyuki. And I was um, staying with some farmers who were practicing holistic management. Um, Opus 21 was kind of their um, business name, there was a vet who was teaching other shepherds about um, regenerative style grazing, although we didn't call it regenerative then, we, you know, we used the terminology holistic management. And I just wanted to show you um, how to start looking at land, and the top photo is very, very typical of most of Patagonia. And then I ended up on a farm, which is the photo taken um, at the bottom. Um, the grass is greener, there is young trees, there's mature trees. There's just a different set of um, uh, indicators happening on the land. And so um, this was what prompted me to come back to the UK and find Chris and Sheila um, from 3LM. So that's right back to 2015. Um, what I also wanted to share with you is 2017 when we went to Africa, kind of a family holiday, and but also we went up to Zimbabwe, which was Alan Savory's ranch where he trains um, holistic management um, in a brittle environment. So completely different climate going on here. And the two photos, the photo in the middle with the two hands, shows the difference between their soil when livestock are corralled overnight in their um, garden growing 
patches, if you like, you can see the brown there, and that's come from animal waste that's incorporated into their soils for growing food. We also um, looked at soil and what happens um, with livestock on land. So the top left is where we drew some squares with our two sons. And the bits of uh, wood there are actually imitating what happens when hooves interact with, interact with soil surface. So they break the capping. And um, the bottom left is where we added mulch. And all four of these different squares ended up with water poured onto them. And we're looking at evaporation, we're looking at runoff, and all the different aspects of what happens when it does rain and what happens to that water. So, Two completely different places, Patagonia, Africa, and then we come back to our beautiful lush and green Mendip Hills. So we've looked at regenerative methods in various parts of the world, and we, you know, we see what we believe, we believe what we see. So here is Fernhill Farm, a quick um, whiz through of what we have here um, on top of the on top of Cheddar Gorge is probably the easiest way to describe where Fernhill is. Um, it's a very ancient farm. Andrew found it sort of 25 years ago in quite a state of disrepair. And we've spent sort of the last 25 years rehabilitating the land and the buildings with livestock. So I don't think we've ever dropped a plow. I don't think we've ever had to apply any synthetic um, minerals, fertilizers, herbicides, insecticides, any of those things. And so we use livestock as a land management tool. And um, we also run an events business from this site and kind of almost quite lucky in that it was a clean slate when we came to rebuild. So we've invested in renewables right from day one, solar electricity, solar thermal, um, wood-fired heating. We collect the rainwater, which flushes toilets, which goes on to an on-site water purification system. We started to use our own wool as insulation and our own timbers um, as cladding for all these sort of accommodation and venues that we run here. So we feel we're very fortunate as landowners because nature actually does provide a lot of the things that we need. And um, this is what we tend to look like um, with our livestock. We've got a small herd of Aberdeen Angus. Um, we've got a flock, many different flocks of Shetland Cross, um, different breeds. Down in the bottom left, you can see that we actually take the wool off prior to lambing. We use blades, or Andy uses blades, and we've got some pigs that are in the woods and helping us do some management in the woods. So that's a quick sort of introduction to us at Fernhill Farm, and I'm going to pass it over to Andy, who will explain more about the livestock and the data. Well, good evening, everybody. Glad you joined us. A little bit about um, how we can run so many sheep on 150 acres at Fernhill Farm. We don't. We partnership and link in with a lot of other farms and a lot of other landowners. We've got a brief table here of some of the lands we're running on at the moment. We have Dolbury Warren, which is a national trust block of land managed by Avon Wildlife Trust, and we graze that. Depending on the growing season, we graze from March through to kind of September through to November. Uh, middle of that period would be some cattle grazing and uh, through the rest of it would be dry use. Lodmore is a block of land just up the road from us. A retired farmer, he sold his sheep, wanted someone to keep sheep there, so that's where we graze. We work in a partnership with Holt Farms, where it's a share farm in agreement. We're running about 600 ewes with them. That's all organic, so that's a, another headspace we have to get into. And then we have a block of 40 acres, which is Iwood, which is solar park. This land is very low lying. It comes with a different set of issues, as does all the land. Basically, every field is slightly different. Every farm is very different. And you have to take that into consideration when you're grazing it and when you're managing it. Uh, underlying uh, rock, underlying soils, they will grow different types of grasses very well. Then we have a block of land of about 200 acres called Aldwick, 
it was all cropping land it's been intensively farmed lots of sprays lots of chemicals heavy machinery um, and now over the last five years this has been all converted back to grassland and we're running a lot of sheep down there and then we work in with other farmers arable units dairy units where we integrate in their system a lot of sheep are grazed on these lands three or four months over the winter months that helps us restock Fernhill Farm to give it a rest so we can bring stock back here for lambing time. Um, we're always on the lookout for extra land if we can find it. We'll have a look at it. We'll assess the grass growth. <coughs> Excuse me, because a, the amount of grass will determine how many sheep or cattle you can graze there for a set amount of time. We have to have an economic unit to make it worthwhile to go for that drive. Most of these places are within a 20 mile. The ideal scenario would be that we had all the land surrounding us here at Fernhill. Life isn't quite like that. Um, and this has been a system which I've kind of run now for about 40 years. When I finished college, it was a case of where can I rent land? Where can I keep sheep? Um, and when we moved into holistic management, there were lots of things that we noticed that was, oh, well, I've actually been doing that for quite a few years. On winter grazing, we would run groups of two to 300 sheep for three or four days on a paddock on a dairy farm and then move them on to the next one. So a lot of these things are not entirely new to us. And we are pretty good at the electric fencing when it comes to mob grazing. As Jen said, holistic management training. It was a bit of a, an eye opener, really made us think hard at times about, but surely what we're doing is good and correct anyway, which a lot of it was, but we found that a lot of these things we weren't actually measuring. We didn't have any facts and figures to go with it so it was very difficult to prove how we were moving forward what was improving and why it was improving a little selection of photos here the one on the left i'm looking over a fence at a bit of land that isn't grazed and you can see how tall those plants are they've been allowed to show their full development and you can see there's Coxfoot, uh, some oak grass there. There is the same height as myself, some even higher. So it's going up to about six foot high. But you can also see just where we're stood that a lot of that land is lower than the other side of the fence. And this occurs on a lot of farm where you've got very passive erosion going on, whether it's where land has been compacted due to heavy vehicles moving around, it's been plowed and some of the soil has collapsed. Um, we do have a bit of an excuse at Fernhill Farm in prior to us buying it, a lot of the fields were topsoiled and turfed. So we started with a farm that was very kind of poorly managed and abused before we got here for economic reasons. That's why the previous landowners had done it. That was entire, entirely up to them. But what we've been doing since then is try and reinvigorate the soil and the plants that are our investment. The middle picture you can see, getting down, getting in, having a look, see what's happening at the soil surface. I'm just pulling the grass apart here in the middle and we've got a lot of uh, grasses that are being taken back down into the soil. The humus is being added to the soil, worms, lots of those um, small kind of uh, microscopic things are working on the soil and drawing the nutrients back down in and this adds carbon to the soil and also gives it the ability to hold water and the picture number three sorry there was just looking at the variety of plants there this next picture can you see the variations in plant length? 
We've got a lot of areas right in the middle of the picture around those cow pats that are grazed down quite tight. You could say this is overgrazing. You can see other, other areas where the plants are quite tall. The reason we, we know that they weren't grazed is that we had to move the stock back onto this block of land too quickly. So some parts have been overgrazed, some parts have been undergrazed. So it ends up as partial grazing and partial rest. Ideally, we've got to allow for that land, that soil, that sward to recover from the previous grazing. We ideally like to leave it for about 90 days. And by then you've got a, a sward that will stand kind of about a foot to two foot high to plenty of feed to put a known number of stock onto for a known amount of time. This kind of grazing allows us to make sure your ruminants, your sheep and your cattle have gut fill all the time. When we're just grazing the cattle, I work as a rule of thumb that they're on the paddock for 24 hours. Um, at the moment, we've got 18 cows with a few young calves and they're on an area of about 2000 square meters a day. Uh, they're getting a bit of hay as a supplement, but we're generally looking then that it's a, about a cow pat for every two square meters. Um, if you assess how much the cow pats are taking up, it's not a bad way of judging whether the cows have had enough feed. And you look always, it's a bit of a, a strange subject, but you look at the, the texture of the cow pat. If it's a splat rather than a pat, with a nice little rise on it, like a cake. If it's not domed, you probably haven't got enough fiber in the diet for your, for your stock. Um, so it's a good way of assessing what is going into those animals. Now, a strange picture. It's about health, well-being, whether it be animal health, our health, soil health, but at times, as a farmer, you've got to get dirty hands. Um, we're not really worried about this. Uh, other people in other industries might think, oh my word, what are they doing? But you've got to be in contact with the soil. You've got to be in contact with your plants and with your animals. We've got to have, in a successful system, you've got to have healthy animals. You've got to see if they're happy, really. And with the cows, when we first met up with uh, Chris and Sheila for 3LM. I wasn't happy with the way we were managing our beef herd. They were outwintered, they were fed lots of food, but come January, February, they looked absolutely fed up with things. Same field, plenty of food, but really fed up. So we then started mob grazing, and the rev revelation of it all was quite amazing. I felt happier because the cat will look happier, and they started to thrive they were milking better, they had healthier coats on them, and so it convinced us to try and spread the mob grazing and the planned grazing across our uh, flocks of sheep as well. This all comes about by having a healthy soil. You use your senses, you can smell if the soil is healthy, you can feel if it's got a good crumb structure, and you can look at your, your land, your soil indices. If the soil and your animals are healthy, you're probably going to be a lot healthier yourself. And there's no kind of problem with having to do work. It's far easier really to do a little bit of hard work and feel tired at the end of the day, rather than hopping on a big machine, making the machine do all the work for you, where you're kind of not in contact with what you're actually farming. Whether you're paying a rent or whether you own that land, it's the soil, that is your investment. If you keep that in a good, healthy condition, as I say, the animals will be healthy, you'll be healthy, and hopefully your finances will be healthy. We expanded the flock quite considerably before Brexit, so 17, 18, we were expanding the flock. Um, then the pressure came on, we lo lost a large block of land which, that we were grazing, but with the rise in prices of sheep just after Brexit, it was the perfect time to cash some of these in. So by doing kind of a bit of a financial review, it works out that we could cash a lot of sheep, 
They were probably making about twice the money which we thought they were on the books where we budgeted. So this enabled us to be able to pay off one of our variable loans, which has taken the pressure off of ourselves. Um, it's not all about profit is farming, it's about feeling good about what you're doing and having a living wage to work with. Some of our observations and simple adaptions we've made at Fernhill so we can do some mob grazing. We can all come up with a heap of excuses of why we don't go and have a go at doing something new. We notice every time we move stock into a field that they always go to the hedges. They pick off the hawthorn, they pick off the sycamore, they pick off the ash leaves. Um, and if you think about it, these bushy plants or trees, they have deep roots, so they're bringing up a lot more minerals. And as we're getting more and more into the mob grazing, the taller grasses and the more diversity that we've got within our, in our forage crop, the stock always seem to look a lot healthier. And now we're not feeding any purchased uh, feed to the cattle. We're finding that we've still got the same growth rates on the calves. The weaning weights are about 350 kilos at about the 10 months of age for the Angus calves. So we've got no problem with the growth rates of them. The cow condition seems to hold very well throughout the season. We've just started the calving again. We calve in the autumn as far as we can. So they've got good clean grazing all the way through the winter. And the calves are quite hardy when it comes to the spring to put them on the better pasture when there's higher nutrition and the calves are going to really move away and graze well and put on a good live weight gain themselves then. A few little um, farm inventions we've come up with. In the middle, we've got a mobile water trough based on just a, a telehandler tire, the trough attached to that, and we just tow it around the paddocks behind our buggy. And we have a converted old pig arc on two big skids that we can tow around from one paddock to another. So young calves over the bleak winter nights, they've always got a shelter. So we find that a very useful addition and at a very low cost. Mob grazing. Um, takes a little bit to get your head around. We've always uh, been fairly adaptable with electric fencing. We work with a, a wrapper system so a little system that fits on the quad bike, it can fit on a buggy, or you can do it by hand or with a wheelbarrow. Um, you don't have to move every day. You don't have to move stock every six, 12 hours, but try and introduce some sort of system that will work where you can maintain that regular move, whether it's every three days, every 24 hours. We've tried lots of different methods on all the different holdings we have different rules are applied. And it depends sometimes on how much forage you have in front of you, um, what the landlord wants as well, how you can fit in with them. But as you can see here, we've got a picture on the left with some sheep on fairly mature uh, grassland, quite a variety in that sward. But you can see where they move from. There's still quite a bit there. We aim to leave at least a third of the forage behind. A lot of that will have been trampled as well. And within a fortnight, that will be greened up. And a lot of farmers will say, well, why haven't you grazed that? Um, you can see the cattle in the middle. The, cattle, the, the grazing right in front of them is where they would have been about seven days before. Obviously, where they are, that's that day's grazing. And then they'll move on to the right-hand side of that picture for the next day. And then summer times when we've got lambs that are going to respect the electric fence with their, with their mothers, we run a flood and then generally we're grazing every two days. And you can see a high variety of uh, variation that sward, a lot of clovers, a lot of uh, fescues, there's bets, sandfoins, uh, birds that trefoil, and the old thistle. Don't worry about the odd weed in your crop. There's a generally an explanation. It's showing you where some of your, your management may have been wrong before. We also do a little bit of experimentation on the farm. Some of it has been um, 
The reason for the experimentation is we may have overstocked when we lamb. Um, we still haven't come to terms with how actually you can manage ewes that are scanned as singles and not allow them to do too well before they lamb. So we keep them quite tight on grazing. That means come the end of April, beginning of May, we've got basically everything has been picked down to the soil. So this is when we found an ideal time to go in the, and direct drill in to the, the pasture some maybe some beans, maybe some oats. Pick whatever you think would be suiting your soil type and your environment. Um, we have found it very useful. We then go back in the autumn when these plants have matured or got a good yield to them. And we've found the growth rates of the calves and the weaned lambs then are incredible. Uh, this experimentation, we moved on to a farm which was a recognised county wildlife site with a huge variety of plants here. But we found through the grazing we're doing, and especially with the mob grazing, we seem to have created huge activity in the soil. We've got a lot of fungus that is coming through. The mycelium in the soil must be huge. We have a variety of fungi that we've got growing on the farm, especially if you wander around this time of year. It's just incredible. I'm not a fungal expert, but there's kind of almost hundreds of varieties out there growing. But as you can see, come springtime, we've got orchids still growing on the farm. So an adaption to the system from where it was set stop before we got here, there is still room for the, the natural plants that everybody loves to see. Now I'm gonna pass back to Jen now. Or is this a time for Sheila? It's just time for Sheila. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Christopher, can you mute over there, please? Uh, we do have some technical challenges. We are um, in Ireland at a conference and uh, we have lost power completely. So hopefully um, this will work. Um, so this is the EOV report for um, Fernhill Farm for the last three years. And you can see that their score has steadily improved from a two to a 23 to a, a, a very strong 33. They're now into the high uh, range. And we're gonna just take a quick tour of EOV before we send it back to Andy and Jen. So when you do ecological outcome verification, um, which is established by Savory Institute, in your baseline year, you do short-term monitoring, and then we do a long-term monitoring as well. And the long-term monitoring is monitoring for carbon and water infiltration and biodiversity, whereas the short-term monitoring is really looking through the lens of the four ecosystem processes. And uh, this is a map showing uh, the farm. You can see it's quite a broad territory that they cover. Um, this is a really interesting slide. It's showing the EHI or the Ecological Health Index score over these last three years. So the, the bar is 2020, the red is 2021, and the blue is 2022. And you can see on a field by field basis how they're doing. And by and large in 2022, uh, almost every field has improved over the previous years, in spite of the drought, I might add, which they experienced as well as many others did. Um, there's lots of data that we capture in EOV, and I'm just giving you a flavor of it here. But for example, grazing intensity. Um, when we're grazing very intensely, which um, was happening in the 2020 snapshot, um, you know, 61.5% of the land was really intensely grazed. We're really eating carbon. We're mining carbon out of the soil and we're not feeding soil biology when that's happening. And that's why swords get tired. They, uh, they get tired out because we're really mining everything out of that soil. And you can see there's been a really nice uh, transition. Um, the intensity has really dropped back. Um, and this, I would say that's one of the key reasons that they've seen improvement in their overall score. Um, and I just want to give you the last flavor 
where I'm going to just show you a few fields and you can see there's loads of data on each field. And this one is crossroads. And here are images in 2020. On the right then are images in 2022. And this field went from a zero to a 25 to a 35. And then this next one is Lord's Lot. And it went from a minus eight to a 25. And here you can see it in 2020. And here you can see that's so much uh, good cover. They, they could cut it. And then uh, YV1 Bunker went from an eight to a 40. And you can just see this really nice improvement. Um, and that's all I wanted to tell you. And I want to turn it back now to Jen and Andy. Thank you, Sheila. I'm just going to get my um, screen up again for everybody. Then we'll just come back to here. There we go. Hopefully, everyone can see that. So, Sheila's just um, given you um, a, a quick scan through our three years of data that we now have thanks to um, EOB. So we've done our long-term monitoring in 2020. Now for the next two years, we're um, short-term assessment and it still gives us um, an index score, which proves that we are actually regenerating the land. Um, with the passage of livestock um, moving around each block of land. So um, you can see here we're now at 33 and that's enabled us to move on to various different selling platforms, which I'll talk to you about in a minute. But um, just as a, as a recap, because I think, you know, I think there's going to be some good questions that we'd really like to answer as quick as we can really this, this evening. So. Um, it's about change. Change is never easy. And one of the things we sort of had to take on board was almost forgetting some of the things that we felt that we already knew that we were taught at agricultural college or in various different sort of biology lessons and things. And so um, as a farmer, we tend to just we want to just reduce our reliance on any purchased inputs. Today I was having a conversation um, looking at how is regenerative products ever going to be worth more than anything else. And it's not necessarily about the value, but I think it's the farming practice. If we can reduce our overheads, then we are still a profitable business. Um, what we found is working with time and nature, things will actually heal themselves. What we have an issue with this year might be okay next year, but something else will happen. And so no two years are the same, and that's the same with nature. Um, we've done blood testing for our livestock for some of the um, mineral deficiencies that are present in our sheep flocks. And we do take veterinary advice. And so we do work with um, professional help for the livestock and for the, for the soil measurements. Obviously EOB helps us but we've got 25 years of soil data from our land. So all of this is sort of indicators on how we can make just those few changes. Um, what I would like to say is um, we are producers of very nutritional whole foods. And I truly believe that a lot of the human health diseases, um, autoimmunes, um, diabetic issues, things like that are actually not necessarily related to, or entirely related to sort of pollution and the processing ingredients and actually living an active active life. You know, we're kind of born to, to be physical workers and we shouldn't always rely on technology to press a button to do it all for us. Um, so yeah, buy less and aim to sell at retail rather than um, wholesale. And the one thing that I'm really aware of at the moment is the messages that we're sending to our teenagers. Um, our 15 year old son is particularly sensitive to the doom and gloom of the future and we have to find something that is positive in the future. And I think that regenerative farming is a way forward. 
um, with succession planning um, on a family farm. Um, every year we record new species, so we welcome back the brown hare onto our lands. I've not seen it here until the last two or three years. I've been here 18 years. Um, we now see lots of new oak trees in our swords. So that again creates new um, challenges because we need to stop the livestock grazing them um, to let them regrow. So yeah, every year is slightly different and there's always a new set of challenges. Um, this is our holistic context that we actually did with Chris and Sheila, I think back in 2018. And we're still trying to deliver it now. And one of the most rewarding um, aspects of this has been awarded Sheep Farmer of the Year this year with Farmers Weekly. And that has spurred us on to actually start our Mutton Club social dinners. It's been something that has been on the cards for a long time because we do actually really believe that we need to eat it, we need to wear it. And that's what we're doing with both our meats and our wool. Um, and just very quickly, moving into um, the sort of selling side of it, EOV has helped us move on to the Savory Institute land to market platform. And we are able to sell our greasy fleece farm gate price at two pound a kilo which has helped cover all the training um, and will hopefully help cover the future um, costs of EOV verification. And that is a um, global commodity that is being sold as verified regenerative. And it includes the whole circle, so it includes growers, it includes processors, it consume, um, consumers, and also it's all from regenerating land. So it kind of works um, we regenerate the land, we get verified, we get the seal um, or brands and retailers get this sort of seal which secures the verification and then the consumers can invest knowing that what they're basically using their purchasing powers. And so this is where we are at from 2015 when I first picked up the phone and had a chat with Sheila to actually on the land to market platform. So we're here to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you both. Um, thank you all as well for putting your questions into the chat box. Um, we've got a solid sort of 20 minutes to make our way through some of them. So if I can come to you, Andy, first and just some uh, more technical questions about your grazing. Um, uh, firstly, around uh, the viability of mob grazing with uh, sheep alone, uh, as opposed to with a sheep and cattle mix. And then secondly, around considerations of can you put those sheep uh, into field when the grass gets too long? Uh, is there a point where that's where that's too long for them? Mob grazing sheep challenge. We use three strands of electric fence. We have to maintain a very good pulse going through those electric fences. Um, I've seen a lot of people saying, oh, you can get, a lot, uh, get away with one line or two lines of electric. It doesn't work with our sheep. Um, three lines are good. We try and keep about 6,000 volts going through. Um, and I'm afraid to say the ones that get out are probably on the top of the list for the coal range. Um, you've got to be proactive. You keep them on the move. They get used to a system. You don't want to make them start eating what they don't want to eat. Mob grazing is devised to have that group to eat what is in front of them, no selection, and then move them on. We have found that it does work. We've put sheep into stands of grass. We can't see the sheep in the stand of grass. Um, they do a lot of trampling. Uh, they do a lot of eating. They seem to be content. It is a bit of a challenge for the shepherd to actually spot the sheep. That comes with its own issues, especially on damp summer's days. We haven't as yet got away from having to use some fly treatments. Um, to keep basically the sheep safe, um, we found that they can do belly cracks, they can be good clean feet, no lameness problems, 
and you can still get the odd one that will get five strike on their back. So we still use some preventative treatment for that. We're looking to cull any sheep that get any fly problems. So I think in time, we can get away from these things. What we try and do is balance between sheep grazing followed 90 days later, approximately with cattle grazing. So you have different impacts on that soil. Brilliant, thank that you. That question. Um, following on from that, just uh, focusing in on your uh, cow pats, and if you're sort of in the field and you notice that they might be lacking in, in fibre, how do you go about managing that? Is that you know, through a change in your grazing and stock management, or are you introducing supplementary feed and forage uh, to bring that back up? What we notice in the spring when it's the grass is growing really quickly, we will still maintain some um, uh, hay feeding or straw feeding. We're on hay. We've made lots of hay. We try, we've tried to move away from silage. We've tried to move away from any purchase feed, reducing our costs. Hay is the cheapest and best we can make. Mendips are not always uh, the best climate for making hay. This summer was perfect. Um, we feed the hay and that there brings the variation in the cowpat, adding more fiber to the diet, slowing that passage of food through the cow, cow stomachs. Um, We've noticed, and my first time I really noticed this was going from our farm onto a dairy farm. And you notice all the dairy cows, it's like fluid coming out of them. And I came back to look at my Angus cows and it was, ah, right. Well, I think we're getting something right here. And the room and fill, room and gut fill always looks content on the cows, unless you have a couple of wet days and then it changes. So you have to adjust what they take in. And animals would do that naturally on their own. We've fenced them into an area, so you have to be considerate all the time of what they actually do require. Brilliant, thank you. And um, one for you now, Jen. Um, just around, if you could go into a little bit more detail in terms of the retail market, how you're um, selling them. Is that through a uh, farm shop? What's your sort of process from getting that to market? And do the consumers understand um, and see a value in, in an EOV uh, product? Okay, thank you for the question. Um, so we set up Fernhill Fibre in about 2016. So there's three elements to that. One is education. So we, we welcome textile students here. Um, one is business to business. So we commission yarns and felts and a few finished products for other small, fairly small businesses that are local to us. Um, they are wanting to, to tell their own consumers or customers that they get it from a regenerative eco farm, you know, within a 15 mile radius. So we supply those with lots of naturally coloured, you know, very pure organic regenerative fibres. But EOV, um, we've been working with HD Wool, um, which is a sort of a global company. Um, and they are the ones that are utilizing EOV to create a polyester replacement that goes in sort of side a, a clothing liner for outdoor outdoor clothes, if you like. So we are actually they're actually doing all the marketing themselves for that, and that's where the demand is coming from. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Sheila, are you uh, able to hear us at the moment? If so, I've got a question for yeah, you. Yes. Up. Brilliant. Great. Glad you're still with us. Sure. So just if you could offer a bit more um, detail on the sort of data capture process of EOV. Is this something that the landowners do or that you come to survey? And what's that sampling method look like? Is that something yearly? Uh, how many points per field? Just a bit more sort of detail on the technicalities, please. Have we lost Sheila? Oh, I'm sorry. Was that a question for me, Alex? Yes, please. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Please ask again. So uh, a few questions coming in on the details of the data collection method. 
um, how, how, how regular that is, how many points per field, are you collecting it, are farmers able to collect it themselves, a uh, few, uh, bit more detail around that please. Okay, thank you. Um, we collect it, um, so we, 3LM, we would send an EOV monitor to the farm and we do it during the growing season. So ideally it happens between uh, June, July and August, but we can, we can also do May and September um, or even October. Um, and it depends on what the situation is. And uh, how many, we do 10 points at a minimum, but uh, like for Andy and Jen's farm, they have over 40 points because it's such a large farm. Um, did I hit all the questions, Alex? Um, I think so, yep. Sampling number per year. There's a um, linked question to that, just around um, more speculatively on your thoughts around developing a uh, livestock health component to EOV, whether that would sort of complement um, between that field data that you're capturing as well and do you see those links between improvements in the field and improvements in the the quality and uh, health of, of the livestock yeah thank you uh, you can see we've lost our power here so I'm by <laughs> candlelight right now um, I think it's a brilliant idea to connect the health of the animal and we would love to do you know other things similar to that what I can tell you is that Savory Institute wanted to be very pure and just focus on the land. And so EOV is a measurement of the land directly. The land is speaking for itself. And they also recognize that there are many other um, verifications and certifications out there and companies, organizations that are doing those extremely well. And they didn't want to duplicate all the good things that are already out there, but rather be complementary. So I, I don't believe that Savory Institute would add something like that. But as in Jen and Andy's case, there I, did you I haven't heard most of what you said. Did you tell them about the other um, certifications that you have on your farm? Um, we haven't mentioned that, but we, we we can mention we work with a greener world, so we're certified um, animal welfare approved, grass fed, GMO free, and we're a pilot farm, hopefully soon to be certified as regenerative with a greener world, which is another global platform which goes across everything. So that's the meat, that's the wool and the leather. So that's the way that we look at it. And Look, just to answer the, the original question about livestock, um, Alex, you know, we have our own sort of herd and flock health plans that we work with vets. So I think, you know, I think it might be covered somewhere else. Um, and I think there's definitely room for improvement on that as well. But it's, it, it depends, it's such a broad subject. How do you sort of define those parameters really? Brilliant, thank you. And just to follow up on those certifications, we had a few questions come in as to whether you're uh, organic certified, and then secondly, whether you have um, entered any of the new uh, sustainable farm incentive uh, scheme, higher stewardship um, options. Thank you, Alex. Um, the share farm flock, that is organic. Our system that we run renting lots of blocks of land off of other landlords were not organic on those holdings. So Fernhill Farm were not organic. I would say a lot of the farming principles we use would match what organic is, but because of the rented land, um, we cannot fit in that, their strict regime. Um, we have looked at a lot of the um, proposed new uh, schemes coming in, a lot of them just seem to be a little bit shady still at the moment. We've been helping out with some ELMS projects. We're just signing in with uh, a new round of stewardship on our farm. We were HLS, we 
finished that well, uh, eight, 18 months ago. So we're going back into the, the stewardship for a, a short time. Um, and we're just looking at ways that will not have a huge impact on the management or the paperwork of the farm, but where we can make general improvements. Um, as I say, we try and work with people with knowledge, as with the vets, as with the accountant. Um, we try and get forage analysis done, not of only of grass, but of conserved hay and silage when we make it. So we've got a base idea about what is coming out the soil or what the soil has, what is coming out the soil and the plants can take up. And as I say, if we've got any areas of concern, we will do, um, obviously doing fecal egg counts. Um, and if we've got issues with the cattle or the sheep, we'll call the vet in and we'll see where we're possibly making a mistake, whether the nutrition isn't right or we have a disease burden, which we can hopefully sort out. It's never okay. seen that you're perfect. We don't have to be perfect, but we've got to find out where our failings are. And um, a question here around uh, landowner expectations. You mentioned that you've got um, the grazing system that you operate. How, um, when you're grazing on, on other people's land, can you just talk to us through a little bit about some of the challenges of, of mob grazing these site? What's the sort of most common occurrence issues that you that you run into in that scenario and how have you been able to navigate through that? Um, it is very challenging on uh, some of the landowners' farms. We've got a block of land owned by the National Trust, 200 acres, um, public access all over it. Um, a lot of bush, a lot of trees, broken fences, boundary fence is good. But what we're looking to do is maybe with them, we're looking to go for a no fence system, the electronic, the electric pollard for the cattle. Um, that's a challenge. We're finding because we can't graze it as IV would be most suitable, we're getting lots of scrub encroachment. So again, what you need to do with all the landowners is actually to find out what they what they see is what they want for next for the next year. We've just taken on a fresh block of grazing land uh, for four months over this winter. They want it picked down really tight. Um, they've got a lot of rough grass left where they didn't take a second cut of silage because it had dried out too much over the summer. Um, the other day I moved a sheep off of one field onto another. The landlord said, why haven't you finished grazing that field? I said, well, I've got to look after the welfare of the stock as well. So uh, we grazed it for four days. I think there's probably another four days grazing there, but we'll take that to the beginning of February when there's a fresh bite of grass and the sheep will mix the fresh growth and the old growth together. So we've got to look after the well-being of the stock as well as looking after the well-being of the landowner <coughs> um, and we try and pay a fair rent on all the grazing if we can get it for nothing we'll take it for nothing but to be able to go back to the grazing year after year we pay generally on a, a hedges rate per day per sheep and a few questions around um the uh grassland and permanent pasture one, uh, do you have any advice to offer on how to introduce more species into your into your sward, how you've gone around doing that? And second element to that question uh, is whether what your thoughts on and whether you should be bringing in additional species that aren't already in, in that um, permanent pasture mix. How do you view that in terms of bringing over sowing with red clover and other species? What balance do you take in that decision making process? Initially, I would say try and spend no money. The, the best way I would say to start off with is by mob grazing and giving that uh, pasture plenty of rest, maybe even up initially to half a year. So you, you hit it, you trample it, and then give it a long rest. And a lot of the, the species that you would like will probably have chance to come back through. A lot of land, that we've taken on have, have been set stop before. So uh, your ruminants have taken the, 
the type of plants they love. They've eaten them out um, and they've only allowed the more fibrous and less digestible plants to dominate the sward. And so by getting the, your, your grazing regime sorted and allowing the, the soil bank, the seed bank in the soil to come to fruition, then you can judge maybe two or three years, give the, the soil of the nature a chance to show itself. And then maybe that's when, if something is missing and you really feel, feel it necessary, then you can oversee with clovers or with some of the, your more selective seeds, whether you want to put in Foxford or Timothy or some fescues. If they're missing, it may be that the land has been totally sprayed out and over cultivated. But even on one of the farms, which I mentioned, which was inarable for 10, 15 years, it's amazing what plants are coming back without us adding any species at all to it. We've just given it a chance. We've mob grazed it. At times, we've probably hit it harder because it's just had ryegrass and clover there. We've hit it. The ryegrass has reduced. The clover came to a dominant species. But now, five years into it, we're finding that we're getting timothy, we're getting the fescues in there, and uh, we're getting birds that trefoil back in. I didn't put it there. It's come from nature, and nature is an amazing thing. Brilliant. And looking back at, again at your um, EOV data, can you run us through on a sort of daily basis how you would practically use that data to inform your management decisions that you're taking? Ooh. Um, yeah, it's kind of like a, a field by field. It's, let me think of it at the moment. Where the cattle are, um, as one example, is where we overseeded a few years ago. We we put in some chicory, um, a bit of a DS4 mix, really, and we just overseeded the paddock. And it was to get um, the field had lots of bare patches in it. Uh, so we overseeded. It's now reverting back. We've lost some of the chicory. We've lost quite a bit of the GS4 type plants out of it, but we've got a lot more density of plants in the bottom of the sward. So we're quite happy what's going on there. We're looking at some of the paddocks where we will be grazing next with the cattle, which I can't remember, five, six years ago, we had a very wet winter. And basically a lot of the field just stood with water all the time. But what we found now is where we've been mob grazing, the soil structure has improved. We're getting better infiltration of the rain. And so we don't get this puddling on the surface with water that can't get into the soil because of the microbial action, you've got your water cycle going on better. Um, and it just seems to evolve and work for you. Um, your mineral cycle, it, you're kind of looking at what plants are coming through, um, how deep the roots are going down. And so this react uh, will be reflected by your healthy stock and whether you think you need to add any uh, minerals to them. We know we have mineral imbalances in our soil. We've got a bit of a imbalance between calcium and magnesium. We have high molybdenum, high manganese. So yes, we still, at the moment, we still have feed tubs out for the cattle to make sure we don't get like magnesium is issues. We've lost a cow last year that had magnesium issues. It happens. That change when we moved stock off a really rough pasture onto better pasture it came in wet and cold and we weren't on the ball enough we make mistakes we're as i say you want to be perfect you're not perfect and you've got to take those knots and try and learn from them and i think the eov will help brilliant thank you and if sheila's with us uh, have you got anything to add on on that question yes thank you alex I just wanted to add that um, what we do after we do EOV with a farmer is we meet with the decision makers and we go over the report and we review and talk about 
you know, how did the management lead to what we're seeing in the report? And then we talk about what's it telling us that could be changed um, in the coming year. And my memory um, of talking with Andy and Jen, especially in the early year, um, the first couple of years was the realization that there just wasn't enough residual left behind, you know, that really intense grazing. Um, and there wasn't enough litter left behind. And I just remember, you know, Andy really getting this awareness of the need to leave greater residual and to start thinking about how to leave litter on the ground to feed the soil. Andy, am I right on that? Yep, very good point. Um, it's something that we're taking note of and moving on from is, I would say, as a guesstimate, we, we used to leave about like a, a, a thousand kilo dry matter a hectare behind when we were grazing. We're trying to leave about 2000 behind now. So we've got a lot more cover. So the animals are slightly more compacted on an area because there's more feed there for them to go on to on each day's move. Um, they have a greater selection because we're leaving a greater rest period. We've got a lot more dynamic um, variation of plants that are coming through as well. So they have a much more balanced diet. Um, there's always plants left behind to photosynthesize. Even on kind of November, December days, we're now looking, we're heading towards mid-November. It's 15 degrees. Um, bit of sunshine tomorrow, plants are going to be growing, they're going to bounce back really quickly. And it's getting that um, your knowledge base learning from it's not it's not mistakes, it's just learning from practices you were doing last year, recognizing where things can be improved. And if you've got a chance, having a go, just have a go at implementing some of the kind of recommendations that come along with doing um, that you'll find within the holistic management framework. Brilliant, thank you. A couple of quick fire questions just before we wrap up. Um, so are you also selling uh, the meat as well as the wool? And is that at retail prices? We are disappointed in that we can't say yes, we're selling it all, all the meat. Um, it's a very hard sell at the moment. We were linked in with a, a specialist box delivery company. Unfortunately, they folded, so that left a big um, gap in our ability to market product. We're now looking in ways to market more of our own. Um, we're looking. As a lot of people will appreciate, you take livestock to market, you don't gain any premium at all. And it's the hardest thing that we're trying to find a way through at the moment. So I'm sorry to everybody out there. We haven't got any major uh, tips on that one. We are selling as much as we can privately, box, our own little box scheme. But that's a whole nother job. Um, and there's only two of us. Mm -hmm. What well, I would um, like to add to that, Alex, is um, EOB is relatively new here in the UK, so we were the first year to be benchmarked, so that's 2020, so two years later, I'm not sure how many farms are benchmarked now, but maybe 2025, 20, so um, to, to actually find verified regenerative products, I mean, you know, they're few and far between here in the UK, but if you... Um, have a browse around, you'll see that we're quite a long way behind America. And the Sabre Institute actually have a very sort of um, exclusive, quite extensive range of um, producers that are all producing something from land. So, you know, honey, milk, meat, wool, leather, all sorts of products. And there is a selling platform available for consumers that they can just follow the link and then they will find lots of big name brands that are also able to supply regenerative um, or verified regenerative products. So it is coming. 
it is something that there is um, a gap in the market for. And yeah, like Andy said, there's only two of us. We can't do all parts of it. So we're just focusing on the wall. And the biggest problem we found with regenerative um, meat is we don't actually need our meat to go to London. We're quite happy selling it to Bristol because that is our local market. You know, we shouldn't be needing to sell it very, very far. That is, you know, the answer is not about sending meat all over the country. It's about local consumers. Okay. And a really nice uh, question to finish on, I think, for all three of you is, um, what areas do you feel you want to see improvements? What are your hopes to see improvements in the future? Just to reflect on that at the end. Very good question. Um, our ability as a livestock farmer and a soil farmer is to be stock content, producing good, healthy offspring with minimum interventions. I think as a livestock farmer, that would be what I would really strive for. But that will take time to evolve. I think you need all homebred stock, and I think you need probably all native bred stock that will give you a good head start on it. And it's not mass produced, it's locally produced, it's happy to be here doing well in the environment which it lives in. Hmm. For me, I'd like to see more biodiversity. You know, I get very excited when there is brown hares and all sorts of different species that are returning to this land because that's always been my passion to be able to produce real top quality food, fiber, fuel, and an environment that's safe for wildlife. You know, we all, lots of people love wildlife. We don't need to sort of get rid of them. They need to be part of our sort of natural landscape. So that's what I'd like to see. Sheila, any, anything to add? Yeah, oh, thank you, Alex. Um, what we are seeing um, is new waves of farmers coming on board that are learning how to regenerate soils and then um, getting excited and telling other farmers about what they're learning. And I just, I know we'll keep seeing that increasing and increasing and I'm so grateful to uh, Jen and Andy to do this webinar tonight with us. Um, we've got terrific feedback on it in the chat and I'm so grateful to Alex Selly and the Somerset Wildlife Trust who played a big important role in making this happen tonight as well. And I'm, I'm going to share my screen just one last time with, and, and wrap up um, with a few things. If you are interested in learning more, um, we do offer holistic management education that's accredited with the Savory Institute. You can take those courses online and our next series will be a Tuesday night series starting in January. And we will now be offering more in-person training. Our next uh, training at FarmEd will start in April. Um, in, at Fernhill Farm, we'll, we'll be offering training starting in January. And then we've got training coming up in Scotland next October. And I'm sure we'll be adding one in Ireland in April as well. So we'll, we'll be adding more training. Um, if you would like to find out more, please sign up for our newsletter and we will um, send you information about future webinars. And I wanna thank everyone for attending tonight. And most especially, I wanna thank uh, Fernhill Farm, uh, Jen and Andy and Alex from Somerset Wildlife Trust. Thank you all. Thank you everyone.